You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy, new fellow orientation series from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 15, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, allergen extracts and standardization. Our presenter is Dr. Robert Esch. He's the director of research at Greer Laboratories in Lenore, North Carolina. is the uh, Director of Research and uh, Development at Greer Laboratories in Lenore, North Carolina. Um, he's considered to be the go-to person for questions about allergen extracts. He's been uh, very uh, heavily involved in research into extracts, uh, how they're produced, what their characteristics are, and how they can be uh, used. I've known Bob since, oh gosh, the mid-1980s. It seems like we've, been, we've known each other for a, a very long time. We've collaborated on a number of uh, projects, and I can quite honestly say that most most allergists who have done work in the field of uh, allergen extracts and uh, diagnosis have have collaborated with Bob. His uh, name is on numerous publications, and he's uh, very well known in the field. Uh, so, with that as an introduction, I will uh, turn the uh, presentation over to uh, Bob Ash, and he will uh, guide us in a discussion of allergen extracts and standardization. Welcome to conferences on line allergy, Dr. Ash. Thanks, Jay. Um, just as a formality, I just wanted to, uh, as a disclosure, that I am an employee of Career Laboratories, which is a provider of allergen products to uh, practicing allergists in the U.S. Right now, you should be able to control the cursor and move the. Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, the learning objectives for this morning's talk is the first to understand how allergen extracts are manufactured and quality controlled in the U.S. There are differences between uh, the European approaches to manufacturing and standardizations with U.S., and if we want to discuss that, uh, I'll leave room for uh, discussion. But I wanted to focus on the U.S. approaches to uh, standardization as well. I also wanted uh, the, the listeners to be able to identify and compare approaches used to standardize allergenic extracts. I mean, there are multiple approaches, and I just wanted to point out up front that there's not a single approach that can be applied to all allergen products. And, and understanding why this is the case, I think, is an important uh, learning objective. And also, not all allergen extracts are standardized, or characterized for that matter, and I think it's important to be able to differentiate the differences what makes an extract standardized as opposed to non-standardized? And there are regulatory reasons for this, but there's also practical consequences of using non-standardized extracts, which uh, account for probably 90% of all the extracts that are used in this country. Well, first and foremost, the uh, allergen extract uh, companies produce hundreds of different allergen products. And they're derived from pollens, uh, various uh, mammalian uh, hairs and epithelia, a variety of insects, mites, uh, food extracts, and fungal products that are grown in uh, many different ways by the individual manufacturers. These products are used both for diagnosis and therapy. and I think it's important to, to note that there are very few products that are manufactured for only a single diagnostic or therapeutic use. I think the, the, uh, uh, the alum precipitated extracts is a good example of allergen products that are exclusively for therapeutic use. But for the most part, I think it's important to note that what Whatever extract is useful for diagnosis is considered as being useful for therapy. And except for, again, modified allergens and uh, uh, certain allergoids or, uh, or uh, certain therapeutic products that are only used in therapy, 
this is an assumption that's used throughout uh, the standardization approaches as well. Of course, right now, foods are used primarily for diagnosis. However, that may be changing, too. Exactly. So there are products uh, that are at the, uh, at the boundary of diagnosis and therapy. Uh, and I think as uh, you make a good point there, uh, especially for food extracts. If you look at the, a lot of the labels for our food extracts, it says diagnostic use only. But uh, if you want to use it for therapeutic purposes, usually it requires an IND or at least uh, 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 patient consent forms uh, should be used for alternative uses. But to review the different sources, I mean, predominantly pollen extracts are the most commonly used extracts in the clinic. And the majority of the pollens are collected from nature, from anemophilous or wind-pollinated plants. Um, on occasion, manufacturers do supply extracts that are derived from insect-pollinated or entomophilous uh, uh, plants and also cultivated plants. So although the most important pollens are the wind pollinated plants in terms of importance and allergy, many manufacturers provide these more esoteric, uh, sometimes occupationally uh, related pollen extracts. In terms of fungal extracts, this is probably one of the most diverse or uh, uh, products in terms of labeling and the quality of extracts. And that's the reason uh, for that is that some manufacturers use the culture filtrates of laboratory grown fungi and others uh, rely on the mycelia and spores. Some manufacturers combine the two fractions and also the, uh, the media that's used to grow these uh, fungi could vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. And it probably, again, represents the most variable uh, extract, even with uh, identical labeling. Then there's the animal-derived uh, extracts, which are uh, made from the hair, dander, or the feathers of uh, a variety of animals. Uh, some even have uh, blood sources. And in those cases, the, especially with the, you know, the mad cow uh, problems that we experienced uh, uh, in recent years, um, the sources of these uh, products or source materials have to be documented uh, to, to have been you know, derived from BSE-free uh, herds or countries. And I think that's... Uh, in terms of risks, there, there isn't an easy diagnostic uh, test for uh, BSE. And so it's controlled mainly by uh, obtaining these raw materials from uh, herds that have been in USDA inspected or from countries where it's been shown uh, to be BSE free. Now, in the area of food extracts, uh, they could be derived from fresh fruits and vegetables during the season. Uh, they can contain seeds or without seeds. Uh, rarely companies provide cooked materials. And I think this is important because uh, some patients are sensitized to the denatured form of a lot of these food uh, proteins. And so that allows uh, physicians to heat these uh, fresh food extracts and to be able to look at both uh, denatured proteins as well as uh, native proteins. It never occurred to me then, to take an extract and heat it up in order to create a cooked form of it. Exactly. Is that a common practice? Well, um, if, uh, when you have a history, I've heard of uh, some cases, especially with fish and with meat, that um, uh, sensitivity is to the cooked form instead of the raw form. And uh, sometimes it's uh, useful to have both the heated and the unheated 
forms of the meat extract. I think this was shown with fish, especially. I think the uh, uh, a good uh, example would be the original PK test. Um, um, uh, the cod allergic patient, which was sensitive only to the cooked form of the uh, of the fish. In terms of insects, especially uh, uh, the biting insects like mosquitoes or uh, uh, black flies, it's important that uh, we provide these. All the insect extracts are from insects that have not had a blood meal, and that's to keep the foreign blood proteins from ending up in the extract. And so, when you skin that with the, can you get mosquito extracts? Yes, yes, you can. Mosquito extracts, flea extracts, black fly, horse fly. Oh, you get that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they're the whole body from uh, the insects that have not had a blood meal. Mm. I think that's important. And so they're uh, almost always laboratory reared, uh, mainly from universities that are studying, you know, metamorphosis or uh, a lot of these biting insects are uh, disease vectors. And so we can obtain them from laboratory-grown cultures as they emerge from the pupa, and then we capture them before they uh, have a blood meal. And then there's different types of allergen extracts, again, depending on what the intended uses are. And the formulations may vary. So I've listed the ones that are uh, commonly available, including aqueous, glycerinated, lyophilized, and the alum precipitated extracts. Now, the glycerinated forms are uh, usually significantly more stable in terms, and so their shelf lives can be extended to about three years, whereas the aqueous extracts are less st stable, but they're less painful upon injection. So many allergists prefer using the aqueous form as long as they uh, don't need extended shelf life, and, and it's included in uh, uh, treatment formulations. Prick puncture diagnostic uh, materials are almost always uh, provided in the glycerinated form, 50% glycerin. Um, they're packaged in easy-to-use dropper vials, and uh, you know, you and in terms of its uh, um, stability and preservatives. The 50% glycerin has preservative activity, but almost always manufacturers include 0.4% phenol for multiple dose vials, and that allows you to open and use uh, uh, multiple dose vials uh, without, uh, um, uh, in, you know, the risk of contamination. Interdermal uh, testing is still conducted with a lot of the non-standardized extracts, and these are almost always diluted in aqueous buffer. Uh, the most common buffers contain 0.03% human serum albumin as a stabilizer. And the reason for this is uh, as you dilute an extract, the proteins have a tendency to absorb to the glass walls in H HSA. Uh, inhibits the loss of potency due to this absorption effect. The stock concentrates, which are um, mostly reserved for therapeutic extracts that are used to formulate name patient prescriptions in the clinic. And so practicing allergists or uh, uh, treatment clinics uh, want the highest concentration available for an extract, and that allows them to combine multiple extracts without having a significant dilutive effect. So the higher the concentration is desired, not because you want to inject higher doses only, but also allows you to combine extracts, because as you increase the number of extracts in formulation, you have a a natural dilutive effect that you want to uh, avoid. There are custom mixtures that many clinics uh, ask for, 
And this has to do with the geographical region that they may be in, and they want certain custom uh, stock mixtures that they commonly use in therapeutic mixtures. And so this uh, simplifies a lot of the formulation practices in, in the clinic. And then there's a whole variety of uh, pharmacy products that manufacturers provide, and that includes name patient uh, prescriptions, refills for maintenance therapy, um, targeting uh, specific uh, concentrations of specific uh, combinations of products. Uh, even with pollens, there's a variety of ways that you can collect. You know, you can collect in the field, um, shown in the panel A and B, where, you know, you can sieve the material directly from individual plants that are pollinating, or you can plant fields or monocultures of certain weeds and, uh, uh, you know, have a tractor that's equipped with a vacuum collector, and you just drive through the fields. Uh, they're collected, filtered and the pollens uh, separated from the plant parts. Or you can bring the plants into a pollen shed and force the pollinate uh, indoors, as shown in the panel C, and as the pollen drops onto paper, uh, we either vacuum them up or uh, brush them into uh, uh, containers, after which they're sieved and purified. Fungal source materials, as I pointed out, is probably the most variable uh, source materials used for manufacturing extracts. And just to give you an example, uh, when you look at Alternaria or Alternata, uh, there's uh, more than 100 different strains available from ATCC to select from. And if you look at Aspergillus fumigatus, there's more than 200 individual strains. I'm not aware of two manufacturers using the same ATCC strain to manufacture either one of these uh, uh, fungi. And again, depending on what the materials are grown on and whether you harvest the mycelia or the culture filtrate uh, leads to this uh, uh, extreme variability in the final product. For the most part, collectors that send in um, uh, the pollens that are used in extracts submit a uh, plant uh, material and uh, the pollen uh, in, for which we, you know, look at the, uh, confirm the identity and pure, uh, purity uh, using microscopic examination. Now, on occasion where you have closely related species where sometimes it's difficult to uh, uh, identify um, uh, positively by a pollen sample. You know, we may do uh, direct immunochemical tests. Uh, for some of these pollens, we have species-specific monoclonal antibodies that can uh, differentiate uh, species of pollens. But for the most part, since due to cross-reactivity, within a given genus of plants. For, for instance, let's take uh, oak pollen. You know, there may be five, six, or seven different species of oak from which we make extracts. You can't differentiate them merely from the pollen sample. The plant specimens can be used to speciate oaks, but uh, uh, if you looked at Im immunochemical tests, you know, they're highly cross-reactive. So we rely on a combination of confirmatory tests. Most of our collectors are, uh, are trained to identify the plants, and so microscopic examination with occasional immunochemical tests is used to uh, confirm the identity of pollen. With fungi, um, I think the consistency, lot to lot consistency of a given strain is the major uh, 
quality control test. I mean, many fungi are highly mutable. And their characteristics, depending on the media that it's grown on and the number of transfers that are made, can have a significant impact on this consistency. Um, the way we select the strain, the ideal strain to use, is based on uh, a couple of tests. Uh, when we selected Alternaria alternata, for instance, you can look at the um, um, its characteristics grown on potato uh, dextros auger or sabras, and you can see that its ability to make uh, melanin or these uh, pigments in different media is a uh, important characteristic and it's sporulating characteristic. But also you can see in this lower panel uh, what looks like uh, these pie shaped uh, sectors and this is due to mutations or uh, in terms of the loss of the ability to form spores. So in this case you can see three sectors that are derived from single mutations of this single strain of alternaria that during its growth on this solid media lost its ability to sporulate and as it grows to the edge of the plate you can see that it lacks pigmentation and spores. So you can't identify by mycelia alone that this is an alternaria uh, strain. But since it, we know that it was derived from a single spore, in this case, that was placed in the middle of this plate, that this is, we know that it's alternaria, but beyond that, the, the, uh, the allergen profile and without its spores, it's impossible to positively identify. So you want to avoid strains that have this kind of uh, mutation rate. I'm going to go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so once we have the source materials, most manufacturers follow the same manufacturing procedure to make allergenic extracts. Now, the source materials are uh, quality controlled mainly for identity and purity, and then they're extracted. Now, the extraction buffers may vary, but they're more often than not aqueous buffers or glycerin buffers in which bulk sterile extracts are produced. And these bulk intermediates are tested for sterility, safety, and uh, uh, chemical testing, main, mainly the uh, presence of the uh, phenol preservative, and they're potency tested. And for the standardized extracts for which we have validated potency tests, these intermediates are submitted to FDA for release. So all standardized extracts are released by FDA, as well as uh, each of the uh, quality control tests that are conducted by the companies. Now once they're released, then they could be diluted, packaged in, in either diagnostic uh, prick test vials or in the stock concentrates combined with customers or um, in its final container and then shipped to the allergists, to the clinics, and where they're used. So in this sequence of events, allergen source material, quality control testing, extraction, and the production of bulk intermediates, and final packaging is what occurs at the manufacturers. Once it leaves, the manufacturers and ends up in the, uh, the clinician's office or in a pharmacy, the labeling issues, the potency testing, and the stability test is beyond our control. And I think that's something to point out is that all of the stability testing, the uh, expiration dates that you see on manufactured products is for that single product only. And once you combine these extracts in the various, uh, in various ratios and different combinations, it becomes almost impossible to conduct 
individual stability tests, you know, for named patient products. And I think that's something to remember is that when you look at a label, it's the labeling and the shelf life and the stability testing that the manufacturers conduct is for that final packaging in that form. So before I go into standardization, you know, if, if there's any questions about manufacturing and quality control, we can spend uh, a few minutes now to, uh, uh, to ask questions, and I'd be more than happy to, to explain further anything that you've heard thus far. So, so the uh, production of these extracts really follows a set procedure for how to produce them, but is the, uh, the content of the extract, um, is that guided in any way, or is that measured after the extract has already been uh, produced? Well, uh, um, the contents. It, an extract can't be better, if you will, than the source materials. If you start off with you know, cruddy source materials, you're not going to come up with a high quality extract. So right. we do a lot of testing up front. Um, a good example would be ragweed extract. I mean, year yeah. to year, geographical location to location, the AMBE-1 content may vary. If you look at an annual, uh, when we monitored the AMBE-1 content of ragweed pollen collected from Kansas, which is a good collection site, year to year, it, it follows almost They're like a Dow today. Jones industrial uh, uh, <laughs> graph. You know, one year you'll have 800 units per gram of pollen, the next year you may have 200. So what we try to do is maintain an inventory of the high and low uh, concentration MBA1 source materials and then when we make an extract we try to combine them. We, we combine different collections to target a approximately 300 MBA1 or uh, units or micrograms of MBA1 for a 1 to 20 weight by volume extract. So that sort of allows us to have a consistent, potent extract year after year, even though there's a high variability in the uh, pollen that's collected in any given year. But when you combine them, you're combining the source materials before extraction as opposed to extracting them, getting high and low, and then combining those together like you would if you were making a wine, for example, and you wanted to mix wines from different vintages to get a certain characteristic. So is that uh, perhaps an artifact of how the FDA regulates the production of extracts? Yeah, it, uh, it has, and it also has to do with uh, um, the cost. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the lot sizes, in order to keep minimize the cost of extracts, and there's an economy of scale. And so you want to be able to make large, uh, consistent lots of extract. And one way to do that is, you know, is to combine multiple lots of source materials. Sometimes it's difficult to collect 10 kilos of a single uh, uh, source of, of pollen. So having multiple lots available to combine prior to extraction is both econo makes economic sense as well as regulatory sense. So when you get a really potent ragweed, you, you all sit around and say, "Wow, that's really good stuff, man." <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep this around so we can, you know, uh, combine yeah, it. Yeah, keep this around so you can mix it with the stuff yeah. that comes out in future years that might not be so good. That's Oops. right. I didn't know that. Okay, go go ahead. Okay, so for allergen standardization, I mean, there's three major objectives. And of course, first and foremost is to assure the batch-to-batch -batch consistency of extracts and to limit the variability. So as, as the example that I, was, I just gave about MBA-1 and source materials, the standardization process really needs to begin at the raw material phase. By the time you do the testing after the extract is made, it's too late in our so standardization isn't just testing the final product. It's employing uh, uh, test procedures throughout the manufacturing process. And then the second objective, of course, is to improve the safety through effective testing. And this came out, I think a good example would be 
in the days before standardization, um, a lot, it was common clinical practice each new lot of material that a manufacturer provided, you know, when you make a, a maintenance formulation, you always diluted the material on the first uh, injection out of a fresh vial for safety reasons. And it could, and maybe, you know, you were provided a, a new lot of extract that was much more potent. Or the, since the stability of the extract you were using was unknown, you assumed over time that that stock extract became weaker, and so when you made a fresh extract, that it would be much more potent, and so you would reduce the volume or the concentration on the first dose. Well, through standardization, you might be able to minimize or eliminate that need. And so, and you can improve the safety without always wondering about the true potency of a non-standardized uh, product. So you, and don't then think, also you don't think we need to be reducing the dose then when we give the new first bottle injection from a new bottle? I mean, that's, that's been common practice. I know, but do you think that we no longer need to do that? The standardized products, I think that there's only a twofold. I mean, standardization, the variability of these assays could be as much as a uh, twofold uh, increase or decrease in the labeled potency. And that is about the limit of what a patient can differentiate in terms of potency. If you do two-fold serial dilutions and you do skin tests, you can barely discern a difference in the uh, dose response curve. So our goal has always been to use potency tests that are within that variability range. So if it's labeled, 10,000 AU per mil, the true potency should not be more than from 5,000 to 20,000. And whether you think that that requires, I mean, I mean, requires a dilution, when you open a new vial, a two-fold variation, you know, I would argue that for standardized products that you wouldn't have to do that. Hmm. But that's one of the objectives. If all products were uh, standardized, we would, you know, we wouldn't have to make it. But as I said, 90% of our products are non-standard. So if you're mixing standardized with unstandardized, then all bets are off, aren't they? Yeah, yes, they are. Okay. So the, the major difference between standardized and non-standardized extracts and I've listed those extracts that are standardized on this slide. And they include the hymenoptera venom, ragweed pollen extracts, which are standardized on the basis of AMBA-1 content, house dust mites, which are labeled in allergy units, and they're the basis of standardization is overall allergenic activity as determined by a competition ELISA. Cat hair and pelt, which are standardized based on the major allergens, LD1. And then grass pollen uh, extracts, and there's eight of them, eight individual species that uh, are standardized on the basis of overall allergen activity, again, using the competition advice method. Now, all other extracts are non-standardized, and so they don't have a standard of potency. And the labeling is reflected by either weight by volume, which is defined as the weight in grams of the so source material extracted in the volume, in mills. So 1 to 10 weight by volume merely means that 1 gram of the raw material was extracted in 10 mills of extraction fluid. So it has no relation to the dissolved uh, solute concentration. I think a lot of uh, people think that that's what weight by volume means. It merely means, of the, uh, refers to the extraction ratio of the raw material and the extraction fluid. The, some of these non-standardized extracts will also have a PNU, or a protein nitrogen unit, which is determined 
uh, using a total Keldol nitrogen assay. So a PNU is merely the total protein nitrogen concentration of an extract. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's allergenic protein or just uh, any nitrogenous materials that are in the extract. And 0.1 milligram of protein nitrogen equals 10,000 PNU. So there'll be a PNU designation or a weight by volume des designation, which uh, may or may not correlate with the allergenic activity. Why can't they standardize the other allergens that are not standardized the same way they do with ragweed or dust mite or grass? Okay, that's a good question. I mean, uh, there are um, problems with many of the extracts where the major allergen hasn't been identified. So there are allergen extracts uh, where uh, that are not sufficiently characterized and we don't know what the major allergens are. Secondly, many of these uh, allergen products, there aren't sufficient number of well-characterized patients to derive IgE antibodies to do a, um, uh, to validate a competition ELISA assay. And to do these competition ELISA assays, you need a reference preparation. So let's take fungal extracts, for example. And let's say that each company has an alternaria extract, which they have, to some degree, uh, measured the alt a one content and so on. But when you use a reference preparation, those qualitative differences can have a significant impact on the ELISA competition assay. So depending on whose product, that FDA selects to be the reference, it would favor that company's product inherently. So there's a problem of, of selecting which or whose product will become the U.S. standard for potency. And in Europe, they avoid this problem because each company has their own reference, in-house reference, that serves as a standard. Whereas the standardization approach in the U.S. is such that there's a single national standard to which all of the companies have to compare. And so with this variability in some of the products, it becomes very difficult for the companies to agree which product should be used as a reference. So those are, you know, some of the obstacles of, uh, of uh, standardization that we have in this country. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, the other um, difference between standardized and non-standardized, <coughs> which I think is important, is how the expiration dating is derived. For standardized products, since we have validated potency tests, we actually conduct real-life uh, stability testing of products packaged in its final product form that's sent out uh, uh, for market. And so based on these tests, the expiration date on the products for short ragweed pollen, for instance, has 18 months for the aqueous uh, non-glycerinated products, and then 36 months for the glycerinated product after the date of manufacture, and so on for houseless mites the cat hair and pelt, and grass pollen. So these shelf lives are based on real-time stability testing conducted by each manufacturer. For the non-standardized products, these tests are not conducted because the validated potency tests don't exist. So how are they, but we still have expiration dates on them. And these are based on, uh, by the Code of Federal Regulations. So these dates, the expiration dates, by law, for extracts, non-standardized extracts that contain 
or more glycerin are given three years dating within the storage system of each manufacturer. And then upon shipment, they're given three additional years. So this is called the three plus three rule. So you can have extracts that have a shelf life of six years depending on how long the, the bulk material remained in the manufacturer's inventory and the time that it was shipped. Okay, for aqueous products or products that have less than 50% glycerin, the rule is an 18 plus 18. So the manufacturers are allowed to keep a bulk aqueous extract for 18 months before they fill it or package it, and then an additional 18 months is uh, uh, given once it's shipped from the manufacturer's inventory. Is there an expiration time for the source material also? Yeah, the source materials, if they're stored properly, and for us that means uh, with less than 5% moisture in the freezer, we're giving five to 10 years of uh, um, shelf life, depending on what the product is. Pollens can have up to 10 years. Uh, house dust mite, fungi, and other uh, raw materials may only have five years. But after 10 years, you can extract it, and then you get another six years. So the extract might actually be from something collected 16 years earlier. That's correct, for non-standardized products. Huh. Okay. Um, an example of allergen standardization in the U.S. and bi uh, biological standardization is based on an approach called the ideal method. And this is a method uh, that is used in the U.S. to assign bioequivalent allergy units. And it's based on intradermal testing, which I'll describe. And what the ID50 EEL approach stands for is intradermal dilution for 50 millimeters sum of erythema determines bioequivalent allergy units. And the method is based on the selection of at least 15 highly sensitive allergic subjects based on history and prick test response. So as an example, when short ragweed pollen extracts were standardized, each company selected 15 of the most sensitive allergic subjects from allergy clinics. And the prick test response uh, arbitrarily was, was selected to, uh, uh, to identify subjects that gave on prick testing greater than about a 40 or 50 millimeter uh, erythema uh, diameters. And so they, these were probably the 10 to 20 percentile of the higher end of skin test sensitivity in an average allergy clinic. And then based on these subjects' sensitivity, you do intradermal skin tests of highly diluted you know, extracts, prospective reference materials. And you use a three-fold serial dilution, and starting with a highly dilute extract, you do intradermal tests using doses that elicit a mean diameter of this 50 millimeter sum of erythema. What that means, it's an average of 25 millimeter diameter. So you want to end up with a dose response curve that brackets this 50 millimeter sum of erythema. And if that dilution that's interpolated to be the D50 is 14, meaning that you were able to dilute the stock concentrate using three-fold serial dilutions 14 times, that extract will give you 100,000 BAU. And then the number of subjects that you use to derive this mean D50, there's a statistical test that you have to conduct to show that the variability 
of the D50 falls within an acceptable uh, standard deviation. So once you obtain that, you can stop testing additional subjects, and then using that mean D50, you assign that extract, the BAU, based on that uh, criteria. Now, there are extracts that are standardized on the basis of major allergen content. And there's two of them that I described. One is the short ragweed extract, which is uh, standardized on the basis of AMBE-1, and then CAD extracts, which are uh, uh, standardized on the basis of feld one And in order to be able to use a major allergen assay, there's two things that need to be shown in terms of defining a major allergen. One, of course, is that, that uh, the percentage of the total IgE antibodies directed against that protein in an extract is significant. Now, whether 10 percent, uh, this was a Rob Alberti that suggested that a major allergen is, can be defined as a major allergen only if 10 percent or more of the total IgE directed against that extract is specific for that uh, allergen. And then also that at least 50 percent of the patients are sensitized to that protein. And then the second definition that FDA puts on that kind of subjective definition is that you have to show that the overall biological activity of that extract correlates with the concentration of that protein. So how do you, how do we prove that? Or how was that proven for FALV1 in short ragweed extract? This shows a correlation between the relative potency determined by the skin testing, overall allergenic activity, versus the relative potency based on FALV1 content. And each one of these points were from extracts that were commercially available at the time this uh, uh, evaluation was done by Paul Turkeltaub prior to uh, uh, standardizing CAD extracts in the U.S. So what, what he did was he surveyed all of the uh, products that were uh, ranged from CAD dander extracts, CAD hair extracts, CAD pelt extracts, you know, they were highly variable qualitatively, but he was convinced that FELD1 correlated with the overall biological activity of all the different extracts and led him to believe, and the FDA uh, concluded that extracts can be had extracts, regardless of their source material quality, FELD1 is a major allergen for which we can standardize CAD extracts. And it was mainly based on this correlation. And if you look at the products that are available today, there are two kinds of extracts. I think this is the question that you asked at the beginning of the talk. And that is, a CAD extract is either CAD hair or CAD pelt. Now, the way you differentiate these two extracts, of course, is the source material. Cat hair or dander is manufactured from that part of the cat, whereas cat pelt extracts use the full thickness skin of a cat, which includes the dander hair and the full thickness skin, or the hides of cat. Qualitatively, they're different if you look at uh, the composition. If you look at FELD1, since the, both extracts are standardized based on FELD1, cat hair extracts and cat pelt extracts that are labeled as 10,000 BAU contain essentially the exact same concentration of FELD1. And that's how the, what the labeling is based. So 15 units of FELD1 is actually equivalent to around 60 micrograms of feldy one 
that one unit is not one microgram, and that's, I mean, the reason being is that the original reference material that was given one unit contained about four micrograms of LD1. But in essence, both cat hair, cat pelt contained the exact same amount. But if you look at the cat albumin or LD3 levels, albumin is an important allergen, can be in some patients. And there could be as much as uh, greater than tenfold differences in the cat albumin size. Now, you might argue that if you have a patient who is sensitive or allergic to albumin, that a cat pelt extract is more desirable. But in those patients who are not, the majority of patients who are not sensitive to this minor allergen, you could argue that you, d you shouldn't include that protein in the extract. So for cat extracts, well, you have a choice. They're both standardized on the basis of FELD1, but there are qualitative differences that may have inherent advantages in your subset of patients who are cat allergic. That might be a reason to consider, you know, doing component testing for IgE. That's right. And I think, or to include both of these extracts in your skin testing and diagnostic, and then decide... Yeah, the LD1 might dominate the results, and then you wouldn't know who the albumin-sensitive people are. That's a good point. It would only detect... The only, uh, the only subset that you would detect with dual testing are the cat hair negative, cat pelt positive patients. And they're quite rare, actually. Indeed. Uh, for short ragweed, just this will be a you know final review of the standardized extracts, and there are different profiles. Mainly, you know, I think the points that I wanted to make here are not necessarily the components and the number of allergens, but the compatibility. So if you just look at the bottom part with uh, compatibility. Um, since stability testing is not done in mixtures, and so the shelf life is mainly based on single allergen testing. So when you look at stability, when I say moderate to low aqueous, and then uh, for the glycerin, glycerinated formulation, we have three years. It's much more stable in the glycerinated form. But when you start combining ragweed extracts with mold, insects, and dust mites, Relative to other pollens, ragweed pollen extracts are very stable. Okay. If you look at dust mite extracts, you see the same. We, we find that glycerinated dust mite extracts are highly stable and can be mixed with other uh, products, namely molds, insects, pollens, and cat. I think the example... Um, of a highly labile pollen extract is grass pollen extracts. Here we find that the compatibility is quite low with molds in insects. So when you combine grass pollen extracts with extracts that have fairly high protease concentrations, different pollen extracts that may have three years of dating when uh, stored alone may have significantly different uh, uh, compatibility or stability issues when combined with other extracts. And I think this is an area uh, that's going to require a lot of uh, future work in that, you know, there are many, many different combinations. And to do stability testing on every possible uh, therapeutic combination, I mean, you could just imagine how much work that would, you know, that would take. And so we've been focusing on trying to combine the most labile pollen extract, namely grass pollen extract, in various combinations to at least come up with what we think are safe uh, or risk um, analysis on these combinations. In our recent, uh, uh, we recently published a compatibility and uh, stability paper that gives you um, kind of guidelines on what extracts are safe to mix and which are high risk. And anyone interested in uh, 
getting that uh, publication, I'd be more than happy to uh, email them to you. Um, I'm going to pass, pass up on this. One of the advantages to standardization that standardized products allow us to do is to derive um, target uh, dose concentrations that we think are effective. When you read the literature, especially the European literature, when different companies have their own unit of potency, it's really hard to extrapolate their findings to the U.S. I mean, you might read a paper that uh, used STUs or BUs or HEP units, and you wonder, well, I wonder what kind of doses, comparable doses, that would be for extracts that are used in the U.S. What, what standardization has allowed us to do was to be able to target maintenance doses, and this is a table which uh, appears in the practice parameters. Whether it's based on major allergen content or um, 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 relative potency units, we can derive through standardization at least an effective dose range that we can target for maintenance therapy. Now for the non-standardized products, where these standard units aren't available, the only uh, uh, safe approach has been, not necessarily safe approach, but the only approach that has been used consistently with success was the maximum tolerable dose uh, approach. Now, from a safety point of view, uh, that may be difficult to achieve, uh, the doses. But uh, that's all we have for non-standardized products at this time. You know, knowledge of cross-reactivity. I think there was an earlier question of why uh, not all products are standardized. I think we can select a priority list, you know, based on cross-reactivity. You know, is it necessary to standardize <coughs> every species of oak palm? You know, can we <coughs> standardize a single oak species and rely on cross-reactivity and start treating with a single well-characterized oak pollen rather than, you know, wanting to uh, supply and market every single species of oak. I think that's one of the questions that we need to, to address is that, you know, do we want to continue uh, supplying 500 different pollen products or to reduce the number of allergen products that we can use and to select those products based on cross-reactivity. You know, should we supply sage and mugwort when we know that they're, they could be interchangeable just because someone from one uh, geographical area wants to use the species of that representative genus in their patients as opposed to using a, a much more prevalent pollen that could be used nationwide? I think these are questions uh, that need to be answered as we go down the uh, approach of selecting which allergens to standardize. So in summary, uh, no single allergen standardization approach is suitable for all extracts. I think I uh, made that fairly clear. If, if there is a major allergen, that would probably be the simplest test to use. But if we can't show this, uh, that all extracts have a major allergen. I think grass pollen was an example. Uh, house dust mite extracts, even though we may think DERP1 is an important allergen, it is, but when we looked and did the test, like we did for CAT, DERP1 does not correlate directly with the overall allergen activity of house dust mite extracts. That's the reason why house dust mite extracts are standardized on the basis of overall uh, allergen activity. Standardization reduces lot-to-lot -lot variability. I think they're the approaches that we use, and that's one of the most important objectives of standardization, is to be able to uh, supply consistent product lot-to-lot -to, -lot to avoid some of the safety issues uh, uh, downstream. 
the expiration dating, as you, as you uh, learned, uh, only the standardized products. It's, uh, expiration dates are based on validated potency tests. All other extracts dating is based on a legal document that uh, allows the uh, three plus th you know three year ruling or the eighteen month eighteen month ruling, which <clears throat> may or may not have any scientific basis. And then finally, uh, implementation of the pra practice parameters that Jay has you know I think you deserve a lot of the credit, Jay, to uh, become more you know to to have the immunotherapy practice parameters become more specific and to, you know, if there is a standardization approach to the practice of immunotherapy, it's that document and, and as that document uh, incorporates a lot of the information that we learn in allergen standardization, I think the two go hand in hand for any progress made in allergen extract standardization can have a positive effect on the practice of immunotherapy. So I think that uh, is the end, and uh, um, I think it's 12 o'clock now anyway. So yeah, we're going to have to stop here. This has been great, and uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Anybody have? Of course, Brock's hand goes immediately up. Uh, go ahead, Brock. Yeah. Hello. Uh, you hear me okay? <laughs> Yeah, sure do. Hi, Hi Bob. Hey, how you doing, Bob? Uh, I, in lieu of all the, the information we've learned about allergens and which ones are primary senses that sensitizers and 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 that immunotherapy works best with those and not with the cross-reactive stuff, and also we've learned that cross-reaction is the rule rather than the exception, particularly with pollens. Have you guys looked at components in your allergen extracts, and wouldn't that be the way to either sensitize them or else use recombinant uh, uh, proteins or purified natural proteins? Yeah, we, in terms of the extracts, we've characterized them so we know what components are there. But mm -hmm. as you point out, the diagnostic testing that is used in the U.S. is predominantly skin testing with the same crude extracts that are used for therapy. Now, unless uh, you can do the component resolved diagnostic testing and link them to the treatment in some way, you know, I, well, I think what, that's, that's uh, what the Europeans have done with a lot of these. Mm -hmm. I think you know, what, like like the group one five allergens of the uh, of grass, uh, those are very effective. Feld one's very effective, uh, and that sort of thing. Whereas if you if you look at prothalones and colcalcins and things like that, they just don't work very well in uh, immunotherapy, but they'll give you a positive in vitro test and a positive skin test, too. That's right. Yeah, so I, I don't know. It seems like we ought to move, move into this uh, standardization from, from what we know about the molecular components. And, uh, well, I'd love to see that because probably that's going to affect how we treat people. Mm -hmm. The example was the cat allergen with the albumin. If you could yeah. test somebody and know that they were sensitive both to albumin and Feldy one, you could use the pelt extract rather than the hair. Yeah, exactly. And I think yeah. one of the the problems that type of uh, approach, you know, is delayed in the U.S. is that we, you know, in vitro testing in general, which is usually the component resolved testing, relies on on highly specific in vitro testing is not a common diagnostic tool. Yeah, any true. thoughts, of, any plans to uh, provide extracts with, with just components as opposed to crude extracts for, for testing? Uh, well, there are, there are some companies that have recombinant allergens, but mm -hmm. none have been licensed for either diagnostic or therapeutic use yet. Mm -hmm. They would go to Cedar rather than Cedar, wouldn't they? I don't know. I think uh, it would be uh, both. Oh. Yeah, I asked, um, what's his name, Chowdhury, the difference between a drug and a biologic. Do you, do you know the difference between the two? Well, the, a biologic is produced uh, by, usually uh, by na in natural uh, source materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chowdhury uh, said that by definition, according to the FDA, a, a drug 
uh, is uh, determined by what it is made out of. So a drug is a specific component, uh, whereas a biologic is approved based on the process for manufacturing it as opposed to the, the actual oh. content itself. That's the difference. Hmm. I thought so it was uh, uh, allergens would be a drug under that definition, right? Well, a recombinant allergens would be a drug because you'd know exactly what it was and it wouldn't depend on how you made it uh, as long as you could verify that the final product was a specific thing. Whereas making crude extracts, you, your standardization process uh, is based on how it's manufactured and you have to manufacture it in the same way each, each time. That's why you're starting with different crude materials and putting them together because you can't mix them afterwards because that would change the way that you make them and you'd have to get a whole new license to do that because it's, it's the process of making it that's approved and not the final product. Yeah. I have a question for Brock. Brock, are you still on? Sure. Yeah, how many, how many uh, components do you think uh, uh, a practice would need to, uh, you know, cover, say, 80% of all the immunotherapy? Probably 15 or 20. Okay. Well, that's a that's very all. reasonable number. Yeah. I so think so. Work, huh? <laughs> and, and, and that's uh, the reason it's so low uh, is because of this cross-reactivity. is so prevalent. The IgE antibodies are made uh, primarily to, to all these cross-reacting things. And that's mm -hmm. why we don't get, that's why we don't lose them so easily because we're exposed to Different sources of the same epitopes that uh, all the time. You might you might get rid of the dog, but uh, they're cross-reacting allergens in cat, so mm -hmm. you're still allergic to dogs. You know and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, I I think it's going to really pare down to a rather uh, small number with a bunch of kind of outliers, like for mold, all you know, things like enolases and kind of weird enzymes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have to stop there. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ash uh, from, for this presentation. Uh, Bob Ash is the Director of Research uh, at Greer Laboratories in Lenore, North Carolina. Thank you for this presentation, and have a, have a great week, Bob. Um, we're, going to, we're going to shift gears now. Uh, this has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.